Tonight, breaking news. Kyle Rittenhouse is a free man, not guilty on all charges. The 18-year-old breaking down in court, falling into his chair. A Kenosha jury acquitted him for killing two men and injuring a third person during protests last year. The families of the victims in court reacting as the verdict was read. Plus, the response outside the courthouse from supporters and protesters. President Biden tonight calling for calm. We are live in Kenosha. Also breaking tonight, the shooting outside of a high school in Aurora, Colorado. The second incident in just a week. At least three students shot. The school placed on lockdown as police search for the gunman. Plus, the heroic actions of a school resource officer. Holiday travel warning. Americans expected to hit the roads and the skies for the busiest travel week of the year. But a major storm system packing high winds, rain, and snow could derail those plans. Al Roker on top story with the timing and the track. Biden's agenda breakthrough, the House narrowly passing the president's nearly $2 trillion spending bill, ending months of tense negotiations between Democrats. But its future still uncertain as it heads to a divided Senate. Garrett Hake on Capitol Hill for us. Surge concerns? The CDC and FDA voting to recommend COVID-19 boosters for all U.S. adults as Americans prepare to gather for the holidays and as a new COVID wave engulfs Europe, bringing a record number of cases and new lockdowns, what it could mean for the U.S. And the search for Jimmy Hoffa, federal authorities combing through a New Jersey landfill, the reported deathbed confession that led them there nearly 50 years after the union boss went missing. Top story starts right now. And good evening, I'm Tom Yamas. We begin top story tonight with breaking news. Kyle Rittenhouse found not guilty on all charges for fatally shooting two men and injuring a third during protests in Wisconsin last year. The 18-year-old doubling over and hugging his attorney after a jury acquitted him of five felony counts following three and a half days of jury deliberations. The trial sparking debates on race, self-defense, and gun rights. Prosecutors saying he was looking for trouble when he drove across state lines and went to protest over the shooting of Jacob Blake armed with an AR-15. But his lawyers pointing to video saying he was attacked first and was defending himself. The families of the victims holding hands and crying in court as today's verdicts were read. I spoke with the great aunt of Anthony Huber earlier this week. She told me she doesn't think Rittenhouse is sorry and is not mature enough to have remorse. Mixed reactions outside the courthouse as the weeks-long closely watched trial came to an end. President Biden tonight urging Americans to remain peaceful. And moments ago, former President Trump congratulated Rittenhouse. Let's get right to Gabe Gutierrez, who leads us off tonight from Kenosha. We the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Inside the courtroom, an emotional moment as the verdict was read. Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Kyle Rittenhouse collapsing. And then hugging his attorney, the verdict, a complete rebuke of the prosecution's case, not guilty not on all five testimony. felony counts. Outside the courthouse. This is just a dark, dark day for America. I, mean, I feel like they made the right choice. You know, it was, it was simple self-defense. The closely watched case had sparked an intense national debate over self-defense and the Second Amendment. I think it's a victory for the thousand-year-old right of self-defense and our young hero, Kyle. But for the loved ones of Anthony Huber, the second man Rittenhouse shot and killed, today's verdict is heartbreaking. Every day I wish that I could come home to him, but I can't because he's dead. And now this system is telling me that nobody needs to answer for that. The prosecution says that while we are disappointed with the verdict, it must be respected. The president also weighing in. I stand by what the jury has concluded. The jury system works. Over the three-week trial, prosecutors had portrayed the then 17-year-old Rittenhouse as a vigilante looking for trouble. Rittenhouse's lawyers say he was attacked and acted in self-defense and ripped into one of the prosecution's key witnesses who confronted Rittenhouse. You pulled your gun out and begin... I'm going to use the word chase. You began chasing or running after a man who was running away from you, correct? That is correct. Rittenhouse came to Kenosha during the unrest following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. He spoke with Blake's uncle right after today's verdict. What did you make of his argument of self-defense? That's ridiculous. Self-defense is somebody enters your house and doing you wrong. He was out on the street. He was a provocateur. And he had these people come to him. Except the videos, they don't lie. 
But the defense says those videos prove their case. I think the crucial moment was the video. Defense attorney Mark Richards says another key moment was his client taking the stand. Before the trial, his team had assembled two mock juries. One heard Rittenhouse's testimony, the other did not. Their reaction, he says, made the choice clear. How important was it to put him on that stand? It was the difference between an acquittal and a guilty. If he'd been convicted of the most serious charge, first-degree intentional homicide, Rittenhouse faced life in prison. Tonight, he's a free man. All right, Gabe joins us now live from Kenosha. Gabe, this case has become so political, dividing so many. President Biden has urged calm, and tonight, former President Trump is congratulating Rittenhouse? Yeah, that's right, Tom. Just a short time ago, former President Trump congratulated Rittenhouse in a statement and also saying that if this case was not self-defense, nothing is. Meanwhile, you know, Tom, this city had been bracing for a possible verdict for days. There were hundreds of National Guard members on standby, but tonight, the scene here so far is calm and peaceful, Tom. Okay, good to know. Gabe, we appreciate your reporting. Joining us now again on Top Story from Kenosha is David Hancock. He's the spokesperson for the Rittenhouse family. So, David, I know you've had a chance to meet with Kyle and his mother, Wendy, tonight. What did Kyle tell you about the jury's decision? I mean, this was a big moment for him. Uh, he was acquitted of charges. He gets to um, start his life again, but they urge calm there's calm after this verdict and uh, and hope that things remain peaceful. Uh, Kyle's reaction, it was clear he was not sure how this would turn out. You've maintained he was always trying to defend himself. Both President Biden and President Trump have now commented on the decision. Is he aware of how much of a flashpoint his actions have become? Of course. Uh, <laughs> of course. I mean, this is, it's been a year and some months um, and this thing has become a political flashpoint and there's there's so many different sort of veins out of this particular case that touch several major i guess national issues right now so so he is aware i mean he's been slandered he's been called names uh, absolutely based on nothing um so to your question, yes. Yes, he absolutely is aware. What was it like in court with the family and with Kyle once the jury explained and, and gave their decision on the not guilty on those five counts? There was uh, a sense of relief that young Kyle would be coming home and would be able to continue his uh, life. Um, a, a huge sense of relief that... Uh, that the jury came to the uh, not guilty verdict across the board. You know, I had, a, I had a chance to speak with the aunt of Anthony Huber, who, as you know, that's one of the men that was shot and killed by Kyle. She told me she thought Kyle did not look remorseful and was too immature to really understand what has happened. Does she have a point? No, no. Of course he's remorseful. This, this affects him deeply. Uh, He's been seeing a therapist. He was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, he's gone several nights without sleep. Uh, there's no age at which you can start to feel remorse. Um, so, so he definitely is affected by this and actually quite deeply. <clears throat> you know, you call them young Kyle. I, I've heard you say that, you know, you, you hope he can go on to college. But the reality is there's a lot of people out there right now across this country who hate Kyle Rittenhouse, who think he should be in jail. How worried is the Rittenhouse family about his safety? And will he go into hiding, if you will, for a while and, until he thinks it's safe? Uh, everybody is concerned about his safety moving forward from here. I don't suspect he's going to go into hiding. He has a very professional security team who will be looking out for his best interest. But I think the idea right now is to let him be a 18 year old kid and start to move on with the rest of his life after putting this behind him. You think Kyle's sorry for those shootings? Is he is he sorry to the families of the men that he killed? Kyle feels remorse that there were two lives taken. That is not lost on anybody on anybody at all. Um, he defended himself when he was attacked, period. David, finally, does Kyle have a message for America tonight? 
Um, this is an opportunity for this country to bridge the divide. There was uh, so many vitriolic and hateful things said about Kyle in the run-up to this, and and just completely false. Um, so so many media reports that just came after him and said he was all different sorts of a white supremacist, a militia, and none of it was based in true facts or reality. And I would suggest that the behavior of the prosecution was abhorrent. Um, and so we really believe that that needs to be looked into moving forward as well. David Hancock, a spokesperson for the Rittenhouse family. David, we appreciate your time. Thank you for joining Top Story tonight. For more on how the jury possibly made their decision, let's get some legal analysis. Tom Grieve joins us again tonight. He's a former federal, former, I should say, state prosecutor and a current defense attorney. So, Tom, were, were you surprised about this verdict? We talked about it last night. I remember the last thing you told me last night on our show is that Kyle Rittenhouse is down, but he's not out. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when we look back at, at some additional information that we picked up as far as what jury instructions the uh, jurors were actually really interested in bringing home, I think a lot of people naturally assumed, including myself, that they were looking at what's the difference between all these different charges. In other words, what did the prosecutors actually charge? What were the lesser included charges that they were open to seeking convictions on? Looks like what they were really after was they wanted to know more about the self-defense law and specifically how it interplays with provocation. And just very briefly, provocation plays into this case because obviously the prosecutor alleged quite strongly in their closing argument that this case is all about provocation. However, tucked away in the Wisconsin jury instructions concerning provocation, you can still regain the right to self-defense if you've exhausted all reasonable retreat avenues, which I'm sure the jury talked about. Do you think this case went off the rails? Do you think the defense did a great job or was it unwinnable from the start? I think that we would have had to have seen some better testimony come out from witnesses uh, to describe in particular Mr. Rosenbaum's last moments. If we focus to see how much attention both the prosecution and the defense paid to the three different shootings of Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Huber, Mr. Grosskreutz during their opening statement, it was pretty clear that the bulk of the trial was gonna be spent predominantly on Mr. Rosenbaum, secondarily on Mr. Grosskreutz, and finally Mr. Huber. So when M Richie McGinnis and some of the other witnesses came out, we had allegations of the alleged deadly threat made against Mr. Rittenhouse, and the final moments of Mr. Rosenbaum being described in vivid detail in court. I'm not saying that that completely sunk the prosecution's case, but it certainly did not help. Tom, I have a different type of question for you, because you live in Wisconsin, not too far from Kenosha. Do you think this case is going to have some precedent? And, and do you think this case and what happened to Kyle Rittenhouse will lead to more gun violence in your state? I don't think it's going to lead to more gun violence. And of course, since it's coming out of a trial court, there's no legally binding precedent here. What it does help to do is, of course, it does help to show that, look, people have to be smart. Don't make bad decisions. If everyone could rewind to August 25th, 2020, and if everyone's being honest, I think that every single person involved is going to say that they wish they could take it back and do things differently, including, frankly, the attorneys in the case, both prosecution and defense, and possibly even the judge. But when you look at the evidence and you sift through the law and you apply the two, it's clear that one thing is true, that the jury got it right. Tom Grieve for us from Wisconsin tonight. Tom, we thank you for your time tonight and throughout this week. We want to turn now to the major storm system set to cause major delays at the start of the holiday week. The snow, wind and rain targeting major travel hubs as millions more Americans expect to travel for Thanksgiving this year. NBC's Tom Costello has those details. It starts now. The great 2021 holiday getaway is underway. And yes, the airlines are under tremendous pressure to perform with the pandemic's heaviest passenger levels yet. That's why we're leaving to go home now. So we don't have to deal with the Thanksgiving traffic. The TSA expecting to screen 2 million passengers over each of the next 10 days. It's going to be a lot of people now. And I think that's going to be a, a shocker. After suffering operational meltdowns and canceling thousands of flights this year, Spirit, American and Southwest say they're ready. Southwest and American even offering incentives to employees to work over the holidays, though employee response has been skeptical. American pilots rejected the offer. This is the new normal. Air traffic is more than double from a year ago today. And at the same time, airlines were asking staff to retire. And it's not so easy as just pulling them back from retirement. Um, 
Um, so there are systemic issues going on. Throw in the coming storm on the East Coast and airline delays could quickly start to mount. But the vast majority of Americans will be driving to their Thanksgiving gatherings, paying $3.41 a gallon on average for gas, the most since Thanksgiving 2013. A 200 mile road trip will cost roughly $27 compared to $17 last year. On the Jersey Turnpike today, the early birds were getting ahead of the traffic. With the flexibility of working remote and other stuff nowadays, it makes sense to leave early on if you can. Roads will be most congested on Wednesday between noon and 8 p.m., then Sunday after Thanksgiving between 1 and 7 p.m. If you're flying, check in online and arrive early. If your flight is canceled, rebook yourself using the airline's app. All right, some great tips there. Tom joins us now from Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Now, Tom, we got to ask you about this. The TSA agents, they needed to be vaccinated by Monday, three days before Thanksgiving. That timing probably couldn't have been worse. There's been some concern about vaccination rates and whether they would be able to keep their staffing. What are you hearing? Yeah, I talked to the TSA. It believes that right now its vaccination rate among the screening officers is about 90 percent. That's a vast improvement over a month ago when it was about 60 percent. So it believes it will, in fact, have most of its officers vaccinated, able to man the checkpoints on Thanksgiving. However, if somebody chooses not to be vaccinated against the federal mandate, then there's a process that they have to go through, a disciplinary process that can take weeks or months to work out. In the meantime, they've got to wear a mask. Bottom line, TSA says they should be up and running fully staffed for Thanksgiving, Tom. Tom Costello from a busy O'Hare tonight. Tom, we thank you. We can't talk about the travel without talking about the weather. For more on what to expect next week as we head into the holiday, Al Roker is back on Top Story tonight. Al, always great to have you. So walk us through the next several days. Okay, so we're, we're looking at this storm system that's going to be coming out of Canada, dropping into the Great Lakes on Sunday. Low pressure will swing through the Midwest. Got a line of showers and thunderstorms from Texas all the way into Ohio. Now on Monday, that system intensifies, pulls away, brings in really cold air across these record warm waters and lakes, creating a real lake effect snowstorm mess. I-95 is going to be wet and windy. And then as we get into Tuesday, that lake effect snow continues, but bitter wind chills will really blanket the northeast and on into New England. We're looking at rainfall amounts that are relatively light, stretching from Augusta all the way down to Nashville, anywhere from an inch to a quarter of an inch. However, snowfall, leeward side of the Great Lakes, some places could see upwards of 12 inches of snow in some of those upper elevations. Now, as far as airport travel is concerned, Boston, rain and wind early in the week. New York, it's going to mostly be gusty winds. Same for D.C. So, again, that ripple effect going across the country is going to be a problem early in the week. Cleveland, snow and rain and wind. Uh, Cincinnati will be gusty winds. Chicago, gusty winds. If you're driving and, you're going to, and you've got a high-profile vehicle driving from Boston to Buffalo as you head into New York, you're going to be looking at snow. New York to Cleveland, from Pennsylvania on into Ohio, we've got snow. And from D.C. up to Bangor, we are looking at wet weather and windy conditions, Tom. All right, Al, thank you for that. We want to get to some breaking news now out of Colorado, where there has been another shooting outside of a high school in Aurora. Police say three students were shot in the parking lot after a fight. The three victims hospitalized but are expected to survive. Police believe there were multiple shooters, but so far no arrests have been made. Authorities say a, a school resource officer helped stop the gunfire and then applied a tourniquet to one of the injured students. It's the second incident there this week. On Monday, at least six students were injured injured in a shooting outside of another Aurora High School. Okay, we head to Capitol Hill now in the major breakthrough for President Biden's agenda. The House passing a $1.7 trillion bill. The bill now faces an uncertain future in the Senate with Republican opposition and possible holdouts among the Democrats. NBC's Garrett Haake has those details. The Build Back Better bill is passed. Tonight, Democrats delighted. Celebrating on the House floor after narrowly passing President Biden's more than $1.6 trillion social and climate spending bill, which includes hundreds of billions of dollars in climate investments, universal pre-K, and provisions to lower health care costs. This bill is monumental. It's historic. It's transformative. It's bigger than anything we've ever done. The vote was the culmination of grueling months-long negotiations between progressive and moderate Democrats and was delayed for another day by top House Republican Kevin McCarthy. 
This is the single most reckless and irresponsible spending bill in our nation's history. Who prevented a vote last night with a record-breaking eight-and-a-half-hour speech. Personally, I didn't think I could go this long. Every Republican in both houses of Congress opposes the bill. This is radical stuff. They didn't get a mandate to transform America. Another hurdle, despite President Biden's repeated pledge that the plan was paid for. Guess what? It's paid for. It's totally paid for. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office Thursday saying that's not true, that the bill would add some $160 billion to the deficit. A discrepancy that could loom large for the Senate's most conservative Democrat, Joe Manchin, still publicly undecided on backing the bill. I'm still, still looking at everything, absolutely. All right, NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake joins us now. Garrett, it seems like the entire D.C. press corps will be on mansion watch in the weeks ahead. What do we know about the Senate and how this bill will move? We understand they're already on their Thanksgiving recess. Yeah, that's right. They left town today for Thanksgiving recess. They want to get to work on this bill as soon as they get back. They hope to get it done by Christmas. That's an enormously ambitious timeline. And the man who really controls the clock is Joe Manchin. He's raised concerns about the overall price tag of this bill, its effect on inflation. He doesn't like the paid leave proposals that are in it. What he decides is acceptable in this bill will be what is potentially able to get to the president's desk, Tom. All right, Garrett Hake for us tonight from Capitol Hill. Moving on now to the latest on booster shots. Today, a CDC advisory panel voted to recommend a booster for all adults. You can get it six months after your second dose of Pfizer or Moderna or two months after the J&J shot. But just how important is it to get a booster if you're already vaccinated? Ann Thompson breaks it down for us. Seeking to end the confusing patchwork of booster eligibility from state to state, today the FDA and CDC authorizing third shots of the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines for all vaccinated Americans 18 years and older. Why did the federal government change its position on boosters for adults? It just took a little while for the CDC and FDA to catch up in the process, but the science has actually been pretty clear for a few months now. Tonight, 17 states are seeing an increase in COVID cases of 25 percent or more over a two-week period. In Minnesota, COVID cases are closing in on 5,000 a day, driven by the unvaccinated. Many so serious, they are overwhelming hospitals. Now the Department of Defense is sending medical teams to help exhausted staffers. When the healthcare system is stretched this thinly, it affects everyone's care. The increase coming as more than 53 million Americans prepare to travel over Thanksgiving. If you get the booster now, you can really slow down spread and reduce your own risk of getting infected. What protection do boosters offer? Yeah, the evidence on boosters is that they dramatically lower your risk of, have, of having a breakthrough infection. We know breakthrough infections can happen. Boosters are really quite protective against that. To qualify for a booster, you must have had your second dose at least six months ago. While anyone 18 and over can get the extra shot, the CDC now says 50 and older should get the shot. Are we going to need another booster in six months and then six months after that? We might need another booster a year down the road. It might become an annual shot. I don't think we're going to need one six months from now. All right, that's good to hear. Ann Thompson joins us now live in studio. So, Ann, I have a question for you. I know you have some new reporting. President Biden had this vaccine mandate for some businesses. There's been a change? Yeah, in fact, the Biden administration has suspended that controversial mandate proposal. That mandate, Tom, would have required private businesses with more than 100 employees to either have everybody vaccinated or tested once a week. That is now tied up in the courts, and the courts have said they have called it overly broad and fatally flawed, so they have suspended that. And one more thing, in our report, we saw those states where cases are rising, mm -hmm. and we were talking during your story, you were telling me this is still mostly among people who are not vaccinated. Absolutely, and it's why hospitals are seeing this huge surge, and they're overcrowded, because the people they're treating, by and large, in the most serious cases, are the unvaccinated. All right, Ann Thompson, first hand, great to have you as always. Thank you. We continue with our COVID coverage now. We turn overseas to Europe where cases are surging at an alarming rate. Austria today announcing it will mandate vaccines for all adults as doctors in Germany warn hospitals could soon fill up. NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons has that story. 
As countries across Europe battle yet another coronavirus surge, tonight Austria taking some of the most drastic steps yet to curb the spread. Chancellor Alexander Schallenberg announcing today COVID vaccines will be mandatory for all adults in Austria beginning in February and imposing a nationwide lockdown starting Monday. The vaccine requirement, the first of its kind in Europe, and a troubling sign of the state of the pandemic across the continent. Austria, with just two-thirds of its population fully vaccinated, reported more than 15,000 cases today, an all-time high. In neighbouring Germany, a nationwide state of emergency, cases topped 50,000 for a third straight day. A health official calling the country one big outbreak. I'm extremely worried. Doctors there fear hospitals could soon fill up. We got the, the three waves before where we had a lot of COVID patients to treat and a lot of them died. And now we are running straight ahead to the fourth wave. Health officials in Germany have so far resisted a nationwide lockdown, but admitted a future shutdown cannot be ruled out, with less than 70% of the eligible population vaccinated. I, I think frustrated that nothing is happening. I think we really have to start making decisions and, uh, and we need a government. But as immunity for those already vaccinated wanes, Germany this week recommended booster shots for everyone over the age of 18. The role of waning immunity is growing more and more in significance. Now, to be clear, the driving factor of most of the severe cases are still unvaccinated individuals. For some, that move is too little, too late. We should have done this earlier already. We knew that, uh, and the virologist uh, told the politicians so. Unfortunately, we are only starting now to to increase the number of the booster vaccination, and hopefully um, it's not too late. Belgium seeing a surge too. Doctors there sounding the alarm, warning if cases continue to rise, overwhelmed hospitals may soon be forced to ration care. At the moment, it's not necessary, and um, it was not necessary during the first pandemic waves. Uh, But now I'm afraid um, that there is a a chance or a risk that we we will have to take um, uh, difficult decisions. Keir Simmons joins us now from London. And Keir, this story is so important for so many reasons, but one of them being the borders are now open across the Atlantic. So the surge across Europe, not just limited to those few countries, how bad are things getting elsewhere? And could this be a sign of things to come here in the U.S.? Look, Tom, there are many countries in Europe that are deeply worried. In Greece, for example, now they are telling the unvaccinated that they should not go to movie theatres or into restaurants. They're not allowed in. 62% of people have been fully vaccinated uh, in Greece. Uh, Elsewhere, in in the Netherlands, for example, they just reached 20,000 infections for the third day in a row. So it is bad in many parts of Europe. In Austria, they are being the toughest, of course, although, Tom, with that mandate that people should be vaccinated, that is so controversial. As to your second part of your question, Tom, a doctor that I spoke to uh, said that we have seen the infections that we see in Europe seem to then explode uh, in America just a, a few weeks later. But will this time be different? Here in the UK, they are not locking down in uh, the way they are in uh, other parts of Europe. We'll see how things go through the winter. The question is, are different countries going to follow different patterns? Tom? Keir Simmons from London tonight. Keir, thank you. Back here at home, disgraced Theranos founder and CEO Elizabeth Holmes taking the stand in her criminal fraud trial. Holmes testifying in her own defense after federal prosecutors rested their case following 11 weeks of testimony that included nearly 30 witnesses. She has pleaded not guilty to a dozen federal charges over allegations that she knowingly misled investors, doctors, and even patients about her company's blood testing capabilities. Holmes set to be back on the stand on Monday. Still ahead tonight here on Top Story, violence in Cancun. Mexico now sending in its National Guard to some of the country's most popular tourist destinations destinations, the warning for American travelers tonight, plus the search for Jimmy Hoffa, the reason federal agents are now combing through a New Jersey landfill nearly five decades after his disappearance, the reported deathbed confession, and Tiger King hospitalized, Joe Exotic moved to a federal medical facility. What happened? Stay with us. Top story just getting started.
All right, back now with Top Stories Newsfeed, and we begin with the arrest of former Jets player Zach Stacy after attacking his ex-girlfriend. Police in Orlando, Florida, taking him into custody at the airport after he landed on a flight from Nashville. The former running back was wanted after video showed him beating his ex-girlfriend in front of their five-month-old son. He's now facing two felony charges. So-called Tiger King Joe Exotic has been transferred from a prison to a federal medical facility. Exotic, whose real name is Joseph Maldonado, announced last month he was diagnosed with an aggressive form of prostate cancer. He is serving a 22-year prison sentence for several convictions, including a murder-for-hire plot targeting fellow Tiger King star Carol Baskin. All right, back now with the mystery unsolved for decades. Jimmy Hoffa, the iconic Teamsters Union chief, disappearing in 1975 without a trace. Authorities now indicating they're breaking new ground in the search under a New Jersey bridge. Maura Barrett has that story. So this is a strike-breaking union-busting bill. Tonight, the FBI might be a step closer to solving one of the biggest mysteries in modern American history. Where is Jimmy Hoffa? The Bureau telling NBC News that they've obtained a warrant to search an area beneath this bridge in New Jersey, between Newark and Jersey City. While the FBI did not explicitly name Hoffa in their statement, the Detroit field office, which leads the Hoffa investigation, was part of this search. The New York Times reporting that this search launched after a tip from the son of a mafia associate on his deathbed. I would be very happy to have our legal counsel here. Hoffa was a powerful union leader, growing the Teamsters into a major force in American politics. But during his leadership, the union grew entangled with the American mafia. But the mafia made sure that Jimmy Hoffa was beholden to them through use of the union's health and welfare funds, through the pension funds, through the general fund, and through the general corruption that was created by Jimmy Hoffa. This made him and the union the target of congressional hearings. That there has been misuse of union funds, misappropriation of union funds, that there have been gangsters and hoodlums that have taken over unions. He was sentenced to 13 years in federal prison for jury tampering, fraud, and conspiracy. Teamster boss James Hoffa surrenders to U.S. Marshals. But continued to control the union from prison for years. In July of 1975, Hoffa was seen waiting in this car before meeting with two mob bosses in Michigan. He was never seen again. James Hoffa is missing. The family of the former Teamsters Union president and ex-convict reported Hoffa missing early today. I've been, for the past 40 years, I've been trying to figure out what happened to this guy. This search, the latest in a series across Michigan, California, and New Jersey over the years. It looks like the Jimmy Hoffa mystery will continue after what investigators thought was the most solid lead they'd had in years. If you've got fuel for your homes, fuel for your industries, a truck brought it to you. Hoffa inspired the focus of several movies. Now, under the Pulaski Skyway, FBI forensic investigators collected evidence from what used to be a landfill. Those soil samples and other materials dug up from the site are now being analyzed. Maura Barrett, NBC News, Chicago. Okay, now for Top Stories Global Watch and the latest on that migrant crisis on Poland's border with Belarus. A makeshift camp that was temporarily housing some 2,000 people has been emptied. The migrants who had been camping in freezing temperatures have been moved to a nearby warehouse in Belarus, signaling a de-escalation between the EU and Belarus. More than 400 Iraqis were sent back to their home country. And Mexico is sending in 1,500 National Guard troops to the Cancun area following an uptick in violence. The troops will be deployed in tourist areas starting December 1st. It comes following two cartel-related shootings in tourist-heavy areas, including one at a Tulum restaurant that left two foreigners dead. The U.S. is advising Americans to use increased caution when traveling to the area. We now turn to the Americas to look at the stories coming out of the U.S. and across Latin America. Tonight, we take you to Chile, a country deeply divided over recent political scandals, growing anti-immigrant sentiments, and social unrest. On Sunday, Chileans will elect their new president in an election that could decide the future of the country. Here's NBC's Guad Venegas. This weekend, all eyes on Chile. Chile voting for their next president just two years after violent protests erupted across the country. And the country likely the most polarized it's been in three decades since the fall of military dictator Augusto Pinochet and the return of democracy.
With candidates across the political spectrum, Chileans find themselves at a crossroads. Two leading candidates are quite a contrast. Jose Antonio Cast on the far right, capitalizing on recent anti-migrant sentiment throughout the continent, and 35-year-old former protest leader Gabriel Boric attempting to form a far-left coalition promising to solve rampant inequality in the country. These two extreme candidates have come up in the polls offering greater solutions to the people. It's been very uncertain certain times in Chile. It's been very unstable. Kenneth Bunker is a political analyst for Chilean media. If you take into consideration what's happening after the estallido social, the social outburst of 2019, and all of the COVID-related government relief programs, people are kind of trying to decide if they go to more towards the left or more towards the right. I never trust the right in general. The country is still reeling from its latest political scandal. Just this week, Chile's current billionaire president, Sebastián Piñera, narrowly escaped impeachment after he was accused of benefiting from the sale of a mining company while in office. Piñera denied any wrongdoing. Hay un tema crisis de credibilidad del chileno hacia los políticos. Después de esta pandemia... Yasna Proboste is a more moderate candidate running for president and trailing in the polls. We are confident in our center-left stance. We understand that these extremist views both lead to uncertainty and a climate of doubt in our country. Chile is also rewriting its constitution after those protests in 2019. Whomever is elected will likely get to sign off on a new foundation. This is a very important election because it's going to dictate the future of our country. All right, on that point, Guad joins us now from Los Angeles. Guad, this election will have significant implications for the country, and I understand Chileans living abroad will get to be part of the process? Uh, Tom, that's correct. So for the first time, the government will allow Chileans and other countries to vote in a presidential election. That includes many here in the United States. This morning, I spoke to a Chilean-American businessman who told me he couldn't be more excited to be able to participate in this election. He says it is the most important one since the country moved on from the Augusto Pinochet dictatorship. Tom? Guad Venegas with that comprehensive look tonight at the Chilean election. Guad, thank you. Coming up, conversation with a killer. Convicted murderer Drew Peterson, also a suspect in the death of his third wife, sits down exclusively with Natalie Morales. What he told her about his wife's disappearance in a Dateline preview coming up. Welcome back. If it's Friday night, you know it's Dateline. And tonight, an all-new two-hour special on one of the nation's most covered, sensational, and infamous cases. Convicted murderer Drew Peterson, the prime suspect in the suspicious death of his third wife, Kathleen Savio, and in the disappearance of his fourth wife, Stacy, sitting down with Natalie Morales. Nearly 15 years later, speaking out in his first network TV interview in more than a decade, we have a preview for you now. At the end of the day, you're saying then... Everybody else is lying. Everybody else is making up facts. The jury didn't do their job. It seems everybody else but you is to blame the here, The prosecution's Drew. making up facts. This prosecution staged a prosecution with, with Kathy. They took an accident and staged a prosecution. Uh-huh. Everybody's twisting it to make me look bad. Okay, they're twisting it to make their prosecution or what they're trying to say against me work. Peterson continues to deny he ever abused his two wives. You weren't a controlling husband, you weren't threatening, you weren't abusive to both Kathleen and Stacy. Correct. What kind of husband were you? I was a loving husband. Okay, I was, uh, what can I say? I was a good husband, a good provider. If you were such a good husband and such a good provider in interviews that we did with you, you talked about Kathleen having mood swings. Stacy, you said, had mood swings that were tied to her menstrual cycle. Yes. How about the way you talk about women? How do you justify talking about these are mother, the mothers of your children? Right. The way you did. Right. You don't see anything wrong with that? Everybody complains about their wives. And that's just a taste of the back and forth you'll see tonight. You can catch Natalie's full exclusive interview on Dateline at 9 p.m. Eastern on NBC.
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.